Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangels, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Thank you for joining us, Pearls with Veronica. Thank you for tuning us on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us and share the file. I'm Jerry Rose Live Worldwide, and welcome to Positive Power, Double Exact Christian Media. Good evening, and welcome to Pearls with Veronica, a show geared toward grief and loss and the process of living forward with Jerry Royce Live on Positive Power 21 Christian Media and Spreaker Podcast Live. You are braver than you believe. My guest tonight is a native New Yorker, a radio and media professional, speaker, advocate, and health strategist, a mover and shaker of all things positive. Katrina Shaw has a passion for helping others, and as the CEO and founder of Maine, Mammograms Are Not Enough, has appeared on My Journey with Paula G., The Red Room with Shay Samuels, and Health Chat with Coach Jean. Good evening, and welcome to Katrina. Hi, Veronica. How are you? Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Welcome. Thank you for coming on tonight. Tell us a little more of who you are and what you do. Okay. Well, I am, as, as you said, I'm an author, speaker, entrepreneur. I, um, I'm i CEO and founder of Maine, which stands for Mammograms is Not Enough, and that is for uh, Breast Cancer Awareness. That was launched in um, March of 2019, and I'm actually a breast cancer survivor. I'm a seven-year breast cancer survivor. I was right. diagnosed, diagnosed on October the 1st, and I birthed that um, nonprofit due to um, help women with um, extra screening. It's provided to help women with extra screening and women that who have insurance and do not have insurance to pay for a diagnostic screening. And basically what a diagnostic screening is, is that the new 3D out, uh, ultrasound or MRI. And we also provide uh, other resources and enlightened women the important, uh, importance of diagnostics to help with early um, breast health and, and early detection is the key. I read where um, you're committed to showing others how to live healthy through natural products due to um, your breast cancer diagnosis. Tell us about yes, that. yes. I'm also a brand promoter, and a for product, um, all, it's an all natural product. It's called Thrive, and that um, that's like a three step process. There's um, 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 vitamins and minerals, a multivitamin that, that that I take every morning on an empty stomach, and then I take a probiotic shake, and the probiotic mm-hmm. shake has um, the, um, vitamin A, D, E helps help with the, help with um, your stomach and indigestion and immune support. And then the third step is um, DFT. It's, a, it's, a, it's called Therapeutic Technology. And what is it? It is mm-hmm. a wearable, wearable nutrition that gives you nutrients throughout the day. So that's a natural product that I, that I also take. And I actually have started taking that because of the type of cancer that I was diagnosed with was estrogen positive. So my doctor basically, um, you know, made, told me to live a healthier li- lifestyle with plant-based foods and all natural and organic foods. Estrogen positive. Explain it to me because I've never heard of that. <laughs> so what it is, estrogen positive means that um, 
I, I, my, the, the diagnosis of the mass is was more estrogen and progesterone positive. So, so mm-hmm. basically, I, I, the mass. That's why how I came up with Maine was that my mass was felt. Uh, my mass was not felt. The doctor told me once once I went to see the surgeon that my mass could not be seen or felt on a regular mammogram screen. So, so, so because of that, I wanted to enlighten and, and tell, give women the importance of, of extra screening that, that that's actually needed because, because of what I, what I had been through. So I'm just trying to educate women of the importance of um, diagnostic extra screening. But because I had estrogen positive, I was diagnosed with estrogen positive cancer, I only had, to, I didn't need any chemo or any radiation. I just needed to take a, a estrogen um my treatment was like an estrogen pill just to block to block some of the estrogen that would make make the tumor grow. So you was producing more estrogen and right. there wasn't a balance yeah. there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So in, in your studies and with this um with with your cancer, did you find that um African Americans suffer uh, uh, have a, a vitamin D um who suffer from the vitamin D? Deficiency. Well, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Vitamin D deficiency is uh, is you at a higher risk for getting cancer with a vitamin D deficiency. Okay. Oh. And then, and actually, and more African American women are forty percent chance higher of getting of of, of getting cancer. Hmm. Wow. That that I'm yeah. learning. <laughs> yeah. I am so, learning. I, yeah, I am learning. That I feel it's a that I feel also that it's important that mammograms not enough because I was on a call the other night and I gave a woman a lot of a lot of information because a lot of younger women are, are um getting diagnosed with breast cancer. And you think right. about it, mammograms are not enough for younger women because they cannot get mammograms. So Right. If, Correct. You know, if they're if they getting up, you know, diagnosed at twenty five or thirty six and because of the, the age you get a mammogram now I think is either is at forty. You know they can't get mammograms, and that, and so 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 the so the the next step is is diagnostic, a ultrasound or, or MRI, because they they can't get a you know mammogram or even even in the new 3D. So so that's why I said it's very important. I always tell women that you know just you have to be a, your own advocate. You know you you kind of know your own body and you know if something's not right. So you need to be your own advocate and you know take the step further to to you know, do what you can do to um you know. Is, you know, that for steps for precautions. So I'm just, and there's so many women now that's getting the disease and, and no one actually is exempt. I didn't have any um, history of breast cancer in my family and I was healthy mm-hmm. and, you know, didn't have to think I had any problems and I, I ended up getting um diagnosed. So I tell people all the time, no one is exempt and you just need to be your own advocate and just, you know, try to live healthy, eat healthy, you know, and exercise, um, drink water. Most 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 people should be drinking half their weight of water daily. Correct. It helps with um, yeah, nourishing your your skin, your and keeping your keeping your um the body alkaline and detoxing. And you're just eating, you know, just 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 eating well and just keeping your and keeping your, especially especially now during COVID because COVID, you know, it's. It's just you know, for the survivors, you know, we're we at a higher, you know, you know, we're at yeah, a higher risk. Right, right or compromise. We got to really be careful about you know who I go around and and just be careful of making sure I'm keeping my immune system up, taking what I need to take to build myself up and and, and stay focused and prayed up. But um, but yeah, we're you know, the patients, <laughs> people that are actually because actually the my the the nonprofit that I have, we are the um uh, resource for the American Cancer Society. And okay. um, and now we yeah we're getting referrals and you know we we're, we're just trying to do what we can do to you know help you know help the women out that actually you know come to us you know you know for help. So I just had so a, that, actually just had it, a fun fun re- huh? Yeah. Is this um is the nonprofit specifically for African American women or just all women, any woman of color? Uh yeah yeah any woman of color. Okay. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I know at times that a lot of times the African American women, um, a lot of us don't get checked because of insurance or you know or right. a lack of you know we don't we have it but then again you don't copay sometimes you stop them from going to see about themselves. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And that and that and that's why I was so adamant. You know about 
you know, growth my nonprofit, like you said, and helping out my community because we have a um, community garden, and you know, that's why every time I get it, I get the opportunity to speak or, or talk or share my story, I always do because I'm that's that's what I'm, you know, that's what my passion is, you know, to help to help other women, and I know our race is at a higher percentage rate, so I try to do what I can do to get the word out there, you know, now let people know I have a nonprofit and what I can do, you know, what I can do to help. As a speaker and co-author of Women Who Soar, tell us about that book. Oh, wow. So that was actually <laughs> the first book. And Women Who Soar is actually, it's all three of them are, are anthologies. Women Anthology, Who Soar is, right. yes, it's a book collaboration of seven women seven, that set told seven stories of how they stepped in on faith, launched their own businesses, businesses and released their dreams and purposes in the world. And my title in that book was called Unshakable Faith from Surviving to Thriving. And mm-hmm. the actual passage that I used in that in that in that chapter was my faith, my soul finds um, rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and salvation. He is my fortress. I will never I will not be shaken. And that's Psalm six Psalm sixty sixty two one through uh, two, that's the NIV version. And I, um, I chose that verse and, 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 the, and the title, Unshakable Faith, because in this story, I, I tell about my best and how it, it's not easy being a survivor and how, right. you know, I got to constantly watch what I eat, you know, watch what, you know, I, I'm, I'm that person when you go to the grocery store that you see looking at every label on the, on the, on the back, just making sure, I, you know, I'm, I'm making sure I'm not, you know, I'm eating the right things that's in, in food. So right. this basically tells about, you know, the, my struggles as a survivor and, 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 um, and the things that I've actually been going through. But at the time, it was kind of hard because my mom actually um, had passed away in 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like a year before, I, I, I was starting to write the book. And it was very hard dealing, dealing with um, um, my mom's health because she actually had a stroke in 2000 that um, – that, that she ended up getting dementia from. And I actually had to watch her die slowly through the years. And it was really hard because I had to basically, and I'm talking about it in the book, how I kind of, I asked God and I prayed for him to let me, because at the time she lived, she was living in New Jersey. And my, mm-hmm. my dad called me, you know, he told me that, you know, your mom is, you know, she's like, like her, she's, you know, her organs are failing and she was on her way out. You know, I prayed and I said, God, you know, just let me get there so I can just, you know, like, hold her hand and just, just be with her. So in the book, I kind of tell about how as a survivor, how I, how, I was, how I dealt with different challenges towards my mom, and that which was very hard. She passed away. And then, then I lost a job uh, 15 years. And it said this was in the same year. But out of that, I still soared because I, I, got, I ended up getting quite a few opportunities. I, I ended up... Um, I got featured in John Hopkins Magazine in mm-hmm. the same year. And then after that, I ended up getting a book project, which is that, and that book project that actually started was the Stop a Warrior Woman, which is, actually just came out this year. And, mm-hmm. and, then, and, then, and then before I knew it, before the end of that year, I ended up getting back into a job which was actually in my field. So that's, so that's basically what Woman Who Saw is. It's talking about me going through challenges as a survivor, losing my mom, Losing a job of fifteen years, and then and then opportunities still, you know, God still gave me opportunities out of you know going through what what I was going through as far as um for in, in this when I um wrote this story in the book. So that's why I titled Unshakable Faith because I stood unshakable in my faith even though I was still going through challenges, and then I ended up right. trusting it in God because He is our ultimate healer and keeper. God, you know, we have to um, lean and depend on him and, and all things and be like Paul, be, be unmovable, <laughs> you know, and and endure. Um, Hello? Ha- Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I, for some reason, I heard some talking. I didn't know if, I, if y'all lost me or not. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, there's a little bit of feedback. I don't know where it's coming from. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> In the anthology where you where it says Courage Women Find Strength during the Storm Volume Two, um, I I read where you shared your story of overcoming grief during the storm of losing a baby. Yes. 
tell me how. Come, let's just talk about that loss. Oh wow, that now that loss that 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 is that's a, a really deep loss. And um, in the book, I it was it was really hard when I talked about that loss because um, as you know, I was with, my husband had um, prostate cancer a year. He was diagnosed a year before I had my had breast cancer. Mm-hmm. And God actually prepared me because. When he got diagnosed, I mean, I basically did everything. I did the research. I, you know, the doctor. You know, I went through. You know, the whole. I went through everything with him, and then the next, the next year, you know, here I come, and um, it was very hard for both of us because, you know, we not a couple of years prior to that, we were, you know, looking at, you know, have a child, and by him having prostate cancer, his, you know, his main concern, you know, getting even before we getting his surgery, he was like, you know, should I freeze, you know, my, you know, freeze, should I freeze my friend? And I was like. Only thing I had in my mind was no. We we just thinking about getting you well, but um, right, that was right. Really, that was yeah, that was a really hard loss because I was forty four and he was fifty, and everything was everything was going okay. I mean, it was, and it was weird because the doctor. I, that's another thing I was I was well, I thought about after everything had happened, but you know I was actually kind of high risk because I basically I was forty four and I had fibroids. So I felt that I was high risk, mm-hmm. but the doctor, she was, everything was going well. I mean, all my tests was going well, all my sinusograms were going well, and and she felt if I had some pain, which I did have some pain doing it, I can, in the beginning, my trimester, she felt, the doc, my doctor actually felt that um, every time I had pain, she just figured I was going to have a painful pregnancy because I have fibroids. And, right. Um, and, and and I had a couple, I had some pain in the beginning, and then I had some bleeding, and then, but when I got checked out, everything was fine, heartbeat was fine, and and we were just as happy as hell, because I didn't have any kids, my husband didn't have any kids, and, and everything was going going the way it should have been, and then, I'll never forget, it was it was my appointment, because I was, I was actually 20 weeks at the time, and it was my, it was my, actually my appointment at 20 weeks for me to find out um, the, the, for the sex of the, um, the baby. And mm-hmm. I went in for my appointment for my sonogram, you know, to get everything checked out. And I went in. I, I never forget. I laid down, and they, you know, did the top for the sonogram. And then I, then they actually looked underneath. And when they looked underneath, you know, they they saw something, but they wasn't, you know, you know, they didn't tell me what they saw, but it wasn't, it wasn't right. Right. And the doctor came. Yeah, the doctor came in, and they were like, um, they, they, she was like, "Are you in any pain? Are you okay?" And I'm and I'm and I'm like yeah I'm you know I'm fine because you know I went to, you know I was fine you know I, every and like I said doing the course of everything all my tests everything that I, that I, I you know that, that I had to get for you know to see if the baby was okay everything and one time I, I did I remember I remember did the sonogram and they said that they they said the baby was tumbling so much and I was thinking I was calling the baby tumbling and they was like it's probably going to be a, a male because you know the baby was moving mm-hmm. so much and because of my age. She was actually treating me as if I was like twenty something because she was so surprised that everything was coming back. You know, you know, everything was coming back at, 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 of my age. So anyway, well, at, at the sonogram, they call, ended up calling the doctor in, and the doctor was like looking at me like I was crazy. She was like, "Are you okay? You in any pain?" And I'm like, "No, I'm not." So she said, "You're gonna have to come with me in the other room." So they stopped the stopped the examination. I went to the other room, and she said to me, "She said, um, your membrane has been exposed." And you're, and yet I was dilated four centimeters. Mm. So four centimeters now, and 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 my it, my membrane had been exposed, and I'm looking at her like what? And I'm like four minutes. So you know, usually four at four centimeters, you're you're about ready to have a baby. Then. <laughs> so I'm right. like, oh my god, I was I was just so I just couldn't believe it. I was just like, oh my, I, I was just I, I I didn't know what to think. You know, I called my husband. I was crying. I was like, you know, doctor said this, so they was trying to tell us what the next steps had to be and they were saying I had to make a decision as far as either um um pushing pushing the membrane back and putting a suture in or mm-hmm. or um or or they were saying oh I could well we could wait or we can wait and, and not get this you know kind of to let it go back normally on its own. So we right. were thinking about you know so we were trying to think, you know, talking about thinking about making a decision. And my husband kept looking at me. He said, "I think maybe we should leave. Maybe we should go to John Hopkins. Maybe we should go to the specialist." And I was like, you know, everything was just running through my head. I was just like, I don't know what. I just want to do the right thing and just make sure I have, you know, save my baby. So then come right. to find out, um, it, it was, you know, I did find the sex. The sex was a girl, and I, I knew if it was a girl, 
I had named her um, Lorea, because Lorea means miracle, and and the middle name was my sister. Uh, my sister, had, my sister who had passed at 36, her, her name was Francina, so her middle name was Francina, and her last name was Shaw. So I already had her name, and um, so at the end of the night. At first, she was she had the, the doctor had decided to let it go, you know, let let everything go naturally, and it, and then they would, you know, they, and then they would put the suture in. But for some reason, she just said, "No, we're going to have surgery, and we're going to just we're going to we we're just going to, you know, I guess you know, push it in." But she was saying, giving us the options of what can happen. You know, we if we push it in, it could, you know, your your, your membrane could burst in the water, you lose the baby, and it, you know, all this stuff. And we're just looking at each other like, "Oh my God!" So we we didn't know what to do. So. She finally decided that she was going to do the surgery and just, you know, and just hope that nothing Repair it. Mm-hmm. Right. And they, they did. They did, the, did. they did the surgery and they put the suture in and everything seemed to be okay. And I was in the hospital for two weeks praying and saying, God, you know, just help, you know, just, you know, hope, you know, hope, you know hope my baby. But I ended up, the, the, the water, you know, the, the water busted. And then, you know, and as the water, you know, of course, you know, if you don't have any water, the baby. You know, the baby can't survive. Yeah, the dry water. labor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, they, yeah. and the thing was that they couldn't, you know, I was asking them all the stuff. I was like, can you stop the, um, because, you know, my contractions started coming. So I was like, can you please stop the contractions? Can you give me this? Because I heard that, you know, so many things you can give them. And I was at the hospital that I was at, they they would not allow, you had to be, let me see, I was 22, 24, 24. You, had to, you had to be six months to um for them to actually, like, cut me. Because they they had a they had a um it was a state law or something that out at that hospital they couldn't you know they couldn't take you know they couldn't take the baby I had to be I had to at least, at least to be I had to make it to six months and I was only twenty at that time I was only twenty two weeks so I was trying to keep the hope help, help, hoping the baby would stay in so I could make right. it to that time so they could try to take her but um it, it you know it didn't happen I I ended up I ended up you know just giving birth and it was hard I gave I gave birth and that they, you know she was she was still to a stillborn child still and stillborn. that was one of the hardest things I had to do and 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 my husband he I mean he stood there and he watched the whole entire thing and and today he would tell me he would tell me from today that when he saw that my little girl come out he said that she was still alive but you know he and I was like I'm not going to tell you you know but you know and it was it was extremely hard because a lot of people don't know when when you have a stillborn it's just like having, you know, when you have a normal baby, they make you they make you spend time with your child. You know, it's, it's like for closure. So we had to they they right. you know, put her clothes on her. They we had to spend time with her in the, in the hospital. It, it, it you know it was it was extremely hard and because she was so little. You know, we didn't have a funeral. We just you know we we cremated her and um, and that was hard because I couldn't I just I just couldn't go to get her ashes at all. So my husband finally did. He went and got her ashes and. Um, and when he came, and I actually have um, the, the necklace that I wear. But when he came to, um, and, and he brought me her ashes, the box, he was a little pennant that he has with her ashes in it. And he told me, you know, this is a necklace for you to wear and carry her every day. So right. I, I do that. And and, 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 what, and, for, and for me and for us as parents, um, as angel parents, what we do, and I, and I tell people in this book, you have to, you have to acknowledge, you have to acknowledge, the, you know, mm-hmm. the, the hurt and the, and the pain. You have to, you have to acknowledge it first. And what we do is I always call her name. Her name is Maria. And every birth, um, every anniversary, we do we do something. You know, we get a cake. We we go out to dinner. I mean, we every every year we do something. I I got the pendant engraved, and then the the front is angel wings, and the back has her, her her name engraved in the back. So so we acknowledge her. We call her name. We celebrate her. And and I was right. surprised this year. I found I, I found a girl on Facebook, and she has a nonprofit for infant loss. But she she has a stillborn. So we so we connected and and that that that's the whole thing. You have to acknowledge your child. You have to talk about her, and that's that's how we heal, and that's how that's how we get through. Even though even though it's hard, we we acknowledge her, we talk about her, and and you know we we keep her name alive as much as we can. A little angel um, door. Yeah, and I think it's wonderful and um, heartwarming <laughs> that you do honor her and call her name because I know for a while after my husband mm-hmm. passed, I. I would mm-hmm. always say my husband, my husband, my husband, but I would never call his name until right. I read mm-hmm. something and said he has he had a name. He had right. a name. Exactly. Call him by his name. Acknowledge his that name. he was your husband. He had a name. He lived. Right. He had a life. You all had right. children together. <laughs> right. So you know, a lot of times when I when I write, I always say and Reginald, I always say 
today would have been Reginald's 55th birthday. Um, we would um, in February. I'll say, well, you know, Reginald would have been married for 28 years this year. Mm-hmm. You know, but I always acknowledge it. You, you have to, you once I believe once you acknowledge the the grief, you know, it gives you right. that time. Um, it, it, begin, it begins your healing process. Right, it begins exactly. your healing process. Mm-hmm. And I can I can only imagine um, losing um, a baby. So you weren't pre eclampsia or none of those things. Uh huh. You weren't pre eclampsia or anything. No. Mm-mm. So did no. you um how did your husband deal with the um with the loss of Maria? Mar Mariah? He it, it was it was hard because he, it was really hard for him too because um you know we you know we we you know we have we don't have any kids and we, you know we was longing for a family and and it's hard, but you know he he you know he knows it's harder for me because I was the one, you know, because on the, like on the mother like you said, it's hard for the for the dad, but when but but the mom is just he knows it's it's even because we talked about it. I said it's really hard for me because I was the one carrying her, you know. Right. I talked to her at night, you know. I you know I felt her, you know, and I said I'm said she was in me. I was carrying her, so. I said, I said, you have to really know that my pain is, is even more deeper because you know, you know that, you know that, you know, I was carrying the baby. So he, you know, he understood. You know, we talked about it and he understood that. But and, and then we talked too because I was hoping, you know, I want to know how he felt. Like you know how sometimes the the, the parents they hold they may, it in. You know, they, they may blame <laughs> they may blame you and say you know think that you did it was something that I did. You know what I'm saying? So. Because at one point we were trying to think, you know, why did this happen and everything. And, and the honest with you, I actually really think as some, that's that's that that's the thing that you know you really kind of go in your head. You know, did I do something wrong? What happened? And to be honest with you, in the beginning, there was there was some things that did happen. It was it was like I said, I did have some pain a little bit, and I remember bleeding a little bit. But when I went to the doctor, and they told me I was fine. She told me that um, she that's that's the thing because I have five boys. She was relating to all me, you know, me having a painful pregnancy and relating to the five boys. But right when I when I realized I, every step that I, I what I'm thinking, I was mis, misdiagnosed as far as what was right. going on with me because once I had this is another thing that's deep. Once I had once I had the baby, after I had the baby and then my baby stillborn, I can you believe that the uh, the, the afterbirth did not come out. And I had to, I had to get a DNC. Wow. Out of all that, so when I thought about it, I was like, now the afterbirth didn't come out. Because I, I always think, I always gotta analyze stuff. I said that means something was wrong with my placenta. And I said, and I said, because there's no way that that, you know, what I'm saying, why was that stuff? Why did that, why did that not, that, why mm. did not that not come out? So then later on, I've heard other women have, I think this is something called placenta prevera or something like that. Mm-hmm. And pregnancy, something has to do with your placenta. So, someone was telling. Then when I read on it, as far as the symptoms and what what happens when you have that, and you get on, and then they, when, they, when you have it, and they catch it early, you get put on bed rest. Every symptom that mm. that, that is that that shit, that's exactly what I was going through. So, but but because my doctor thought, you know, it was something, it was you know, she that option because mm-hmm. I had fibroids. She kept thinking, you know, the pain was coming. You got painful pregnancy, is you know. And so I, I later on I said, you know what? That's what happened. I was I was misdiagnosed. If, if, if I was seeing a high risk OBGYN, which I did not know, people were telling me that after I lost the baby, I'm like, oh, thank you. I had no, I didn't know anything about an OBGYN. I mean, a high risk OBGYN. High risk. And I should have right. been, yeah. And I should have been going to high risk. I was 44 and I had fibroids, but I was going to, I was not I'm going to a, 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 a high risk OBGYN. Risk. Yeah. So that was one thing. And then the second thing I think I was misdiagnosed and. You know, but but what what you know? I lost the baby, and like I said, I you know, it's just a, what our healing is just acknowledging her and celebrating her every year. And I have a memory box and her clothes in it, her little mm-hmm. sonogram um, her pictures and her and her um like um sonogram pictures and all. So you know, I, we try to do whatever we can do to honor her. But yeah, it's hard for both of us. But but what we had to do is we had to talk about it. You know, I, I actually right. get his feels to make sure he didn't feel that I did something wrong. And he was like, no, I don't think you, you know, so we talked about it. Cause that was, that was hurting me too. Cause I didn't know how he felt thinking that, you know, right. I didn't want him to blame me for, you know, cause I was the one carrying the baby. But, um, but yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's I, um, how I'm not, I, and I relate to that because I had a placenta tear. <laughs> Um, uh-huh. my last child um is a uh-huh. girl, and uh-huh. I was pre I was preeclampsia. Okay. Um, and at that time she and when you said the afterbirth was uh-huh. still there, she was sitting on top of. She was she she was sitting on top of because it, it shifted and it was blocking the birth canal. So I you wow. Know, so they had to naturally wait for. Um, my, you know, for it to move on its own, and wow. for her to be born, but she was born early, and I was, and I went to high risk, um, OB, um, OB. I went to him, OBGYN, and I, yeah, OBGYN, and I, Dr. Big, I had been one, I've been one Dr. Big for the last twenty something years, so, and he mm-hmm. deals, and he dealt with high risk pregnancies, and what well, he was awesome. The whole team was awesome. Um, there is that not, and that's what it is. You, at a high risk, they look at you more. You know what I'm saying? They then they know what to look for, and they check they check you more. You know. Yeah. But like you, yeah. and you saying you were cramping. I'm like, oh my god, I, I was cramping, and I kept saying, oh my god, I, I think I'm trying to lose this baby. And I and that's what I kept saying. I said, I keep. I said, I'm cramping. I was telling my yeah. husband. I said, right. well, you know, I said I'm cramping so bad. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm cramping like I said, but a menstrual or something. And he said, mm-hmm. okay, we're calling the doctor. We're going, we're going to the emergency room. I may have stayed in the hospital more than I worked because she was the only pregnancy that I actually worked, <laughs> and it wasn't a wow. um, high demanding job or anything. But um, uh-huh. I was able to work that you know the entire almost the entire. But she was a preemie. She was born about a month and a half early, and they didn't okay. want to um he, they didn't want to take her right away because they wanted her lungs to be developed. And so every right. every so often, once a week, I thought I was going to, to check. They were, they were checking her lungs, checking her lungs. And, and finally, um, when she was stopped, I don't know, she just positioned herself. I guess she moved the, the presenter up. <laughs> right. <laughs> she could get in a birthing <laughs> position. <laughs> and uh-huh. and I was preeclampsia. And during that time of me, uh, like, I was seeing stars. I knew, I'm like, okay, I'm seeing shooting stars here. I'm seeing uh-huh. dots and things. And with my pressure, you know, like you say, high risk, age, and everything. Right. I think I mean, I think I was about thirty three, uh, thirty. I think I was thirty three uh-huh. when I got pregnant with Olivia, and okay, um, it just, you know, and and I and, and that was the thing of, I I had mm-hmm. the same feelings and thoughts as you. What 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 did I do wrong? And I cried right. the whole time because I didn't get to see my baby until she was born on a Wednesday. I didn't get to see her till like that Friday or Saturday, and I cried because uh-huh. she was in the NICU. And I'm like, right. What, mm-hmm. what did I not eat proper? Um, right. I took my vitamins. You know, so I'm, all uh-huh. these thoughts are going through your head. What is it that right. I did not do? You know, was it environmental? You know, you know what what happened here? <laughs> you know, right. Um, exactly. And we talked and we talked about it because, like you said, you have to engage them. And I and I and like you, I wonder how are mm-hmm. if he will he blame me for me having this baby this soon? And you know, right. you know what was it? And I'm saying, well. Uh-huh. And I talked to him, and he said, well, no, I, I don't blame you. You, you know, it's it just nature. It's just nature. And, you right. know, we just was really grateful and thankful for, you know, mm-hmm. Dr. Big and his staff. Um, because mm-hmm. th- that was a very, that was one of my most difficult pregnancies. That was one of my most right. difficult pregnancies. And I, mm-hmm. I guess I can relate. <laughs> I can yeah, definitely relate, you know, yeah. to, to, to that. Because I didn't have fibroids. Or anything, mm-hmm. but when you were talking about the pain, and I'm like, God, I said that sounds like pain. But not, but, not, but you got to, this is it. Not only did I have the pain, this is exactly what happened. And, and, and when I read about, um, what did you say you had again? What was the name? Preeclampsia. I was preeclampsia. Right. I think that's what that think that's what the, I, I read about. It's, it's called pre. But that's, that's probably the same thing because when I read all about the, the symptoms, it says you bleed. And they said, and, and you do, and you have cramping, and that's what happened to me. I, I one, I was one day, I, I, I bled, you know, like I not a lot, but I, I went to the bathroom and I saw blood come out, and then I said, oh my god, you know, I, I was freaked. You know, my, my husband actually at the time he was, he was, um, he's a musician, he was playing, practicing somewhere. So I called, I called him, I said, please come home. I said, I'm, please. I said, I'm gonna lose the baby, but, but he came home. And that's when we went to the doctor because it stopped though. I just, I just rushed out, and then you know, some, and then it just stopped. 
And then um, then I was cramping. Like I said, I saw the cramping. So they was like, you know, come in if you still, you know, cramping. And it felt like, you know, the cramping felt like, you know, like labor, you know, pain. Like not heart pains, like, you know, maybe it might have been labor mm-hmm. pain. I don't know. So I called that class and I called the doctor and I said, I'm, you know, cramping, whatever. And they was like, oh, you you can have a heart pregnancy because you have fibroids. So that's, that's the whole thing that, that kind of pissed me off. And I keep looking back at it because they just kept thinking everything, little thing I had wrong, you know, if it was a pain, it was fibroids. So I, they came in and they checked me, but I really don't think they checked underneath like like how they did like the last time when I saw that my membrane was exposed. Because when I think mm-hmm. back, I'm thinking from the pain and the clamping, my cervix was obviously opened up slowly and slowly, slowly and slowly. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and, I didn't, and that's probably why I was clamping because I was my cervix was probably constantly opening up really slow. Because come on, I was four centimeters by the time that my membrane was exposed. Mm-hmm. Four centimeters. I'm, I was ready to have the baby at four centimeters. You were, yep, yep, yeah, yes, you walking, were. Walk, girl, you should see me. I'm walking. In, I, I never forget. I was so happy that day. I was walking. I had my little boots on. I'm going to see <laughs> sex with my baby. I'm, you know, all fine. I go on my appointment. No pain. They looked at me. They was like, you don't have any pain? I'm like, no, I'm fine. And she was like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah. And she told me what was going on. I was like, you have got to be kidding. And everybody kept saying, you were four centimeters. You, you didn't have any pain? I'm like, no, I didn't have any pain at all. I was fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, um, so. with him being a high risk um OBGYN um mm-hmm. and with and me doing my research on preeclampsia, it begins around that twentieth week of pregnancy. Yeah, it begins around you know and, and like um and mm-hmm. it's dealing with um high blood pressure because I had high blood right. I, and I, I never had pressure pressure problems, so I mm-hmm. had high blood pressure. I had edema, and then I had protein in my urine. So wow. you can't imagine. I'm worried about, okay, all of these things are happening. To me. What about my baby? <laughs> like, what's happening right, to my exactly. baby? I was more concerned about right. my baby than I was about me. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, oh, right. no, 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 no. And I was on, I was on bed rest. I think mm-hmm. I may have, I had a baby shower one day. The next day, I'm, I'm, I'm at the doctor's office, and he said, if your pressure is high, this, if it's not where I need right. it to be and where it should be, I'm going to admit you, and I cry because that uh-huh. Mother's Day was a Sunday, uh-huh. and I never forget uh-huh. it. We had walked around the park. I took my two mm-hmm. older children. And I said, um, "We gonna walk. We gonna walk the park." And that Monday, I took them to something to eat because my appointment was that Monday. Mm-hmm. And um, he, when he walked in, he immediately said, you know, "He said." And I, when I saw him and the look on his face, mm-hmm. I said, my pressure is not where it needs to be. And he said, who you have with you? And I began to cry. So I had my children with me. I said, my two older kids are with me. And um, wow. and the nurse came in. She said, we, we, we have to admit you. And he said, my business here and my job here mm-hmm. is to stay two lives. I, I don't need a mama here, a, a, a child here without a mother. I need both right. of you here. And he would not. They were saying, you, can you cut her? He said, if I cut her, she'll bleed to death. Wow. wow. And all yeah. I could do was thank, you know, thank, I'm like, God, I thank you, mm-hmm. you know, for, for right. you, you kept me here for a reason because some right. women don't make it in the condition right. that I was in. You know, right. the baby exactly. don't make it in the condition mm-hmm. that I was in. She was fine. It was me. So they induced right. my labor because I was the one that was having a problem. She was breathing like she was gone with the wind. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I laugh at uh-huh. it because now she runs like uh-huh. she's gone with the wind. <laughs> she runs like when she's gone with the wind, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that she is does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, in, 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 it's just so amazing, the similarities, mm-hmm. you know, with us in, in, in this process, because I, too, see now that I stood that chance of mm-hmm. having a stillborn baby, you know, right. uh, of giving birth to her, you know, and she's mm-hmm. still stillborn, and I'm right. going, oh my God, Olivia, you are so blessed, you know, and, mm-hmm. and and just grateful to God for the journey because we get to talk about our talk about our pain and and mm-hmm. to help somebody, someone else, and then we walk into our purpose, and I'm just loving right. Maine, <laughs> yes. you know, loving the <laughs> anthologies and everything, you know, although. You know, last week, you know, canceling the show at the last mm-hmm. minute, I think we, we had, I had so, death was like back yeah. to back for the last wow. two weeks. I'm going, oh, I'm like, you know what I said? This is so mind boggling. Um, yeah. and, and then, you know, another found out about two 
this week, and I'm going, okay, God, what, what's going on here? What's going on here? You, you know, said somebody and, else this week? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. A long what? time um, lawyer friend of ours, he was more like oh, family wow. than anything. He was like a second dad to me. And uh-huh. I knew he already, he had um, he had cancer, and um, mm-hmm. he had a, uh-huh. he had an organ transplant. So what? Uh, and with those organ transplant comes um, the skin cancer. And but oh, he didn't wow. die from that. He had a procedure done. So I just spoken with him a couple of months ago. He said um, uh, in October I'll be going to have a procedure done. I said okay. I said well just let me know and I'll just come clean the house up for you. You know and sanitize mm-hmm. things for you so that you know when you come from the hospital everything will be fine. But he had right. a heart attack. He had, a, he had complications wow. and died of a heart attack, yeah. Oh, that's mm, terrible. I just love wow. the education part of, you know, of you educating our women about, um, or, you know, mammograms are not enough. You know, right. mammograms are not enough. And educate them also, you know, on the loss of, yes. on the loss of your, of your, of, 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 the, of your baby. Yes. And how you, know you what, dealt too? with it. Yes, you know what too, because I, because um, because that that's that's basically what's going to be going to actually be my next book. <laughs> my next book of basically was going to be uh, the story of um, you know, Maria and how you know me and my Maria. husband, you know, uh, uh, the story about how we you know got through the journey of that. But I saw something on OWN called I, well, I don't know if you've seen it. It's called it's called Black Love, right? It's up. It's a new series mm-hmm. on OWN, and there was a couple okay. on there that lost that 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 same thing that lost the um child but the, but with them they she went through the whole she was at the end of her pregnancy and ended up losing a child and one of my girlfriends called me because the, the um when she when she heard the story and she heard them talk about the baby and how they acknowledge her and and you know how you know how they feel and and the, the love they still have it's, it's, and it's, it's something because it's you have a child that's not here and it's and this is this explain how you know what we have, what, the pain that we have to deal with, but we still have to, you right. know, keep her, you know, you know, still keep, you know, keep keep her name alive. So when, right. So when, um, so she didn't under, she really didn't understand because when I when I would tell her like the things that we do every year when my because my because her death date is January twenty second, and every year you know I would tell her oh I'm you know I'm get, I'm buying a cake I'm baking a cake and and I'm mm-hmm. doing this we doing this we going out to dinner and we you know we, we always every year we do we do something last year I got I got this necklace called um angel mommy it has like a, her wings around it and it has like little baby seed diamonds in it so I will also so she didn't understand as a friend you know you know uh, uh, looking at out she didn't really understand what me and my husband was actually you know going through as you know as, as angel parents you know of, of, a, of a child that right. had and when she saw that story on Black Love, she said, Katrina, this, she said, it's going to be hard. But she said, oh, my God. She said, when I watched that, the story of that, the parents, of the, their, 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 what they did and how she lost that child, she said, now I know and I understand why you, how, how you and Johnny feel and how, why you do what you do. She said, I, mm-hmm. said, I said, really, to be honest with you, I said, I wish I could tell everyone that's close to me to look at, you know what I'm saying, to actually re, you know, look at that, that, that um, series. So they can know why we do what we do and what you know how we feel and what we. So she said, right, and they have now. a better said, understanding and, and appreciate yeah. what right. you do. You know the who, right. the why, and and the, right. the how of it because this is our yes. pain. It's real. It happened to right. us, and this is how we're going through our journey. We're living forward and on, you know, and and um, bring keeping her memory alive because she she right. has the name. Yes, and and that's what they were saying. They were calling her name and. And the husband was, you know, telling the whole story and how that he has to really love his wife more because of, because she was not, he understands, he said, because I'm, I'm in pain, but she was the one that was carrying her. He said, she was the mm-hmm. mother of, of, of my baby, you know, and it was, that story was, you know, I just cried when I, when I, when I listened to it, because, you know, it was just, I was thinking of me and Johnny, even though we didn't get to, you know, all the way to the end of, you know, and oh, to give birth to Maria, but right. still, I mean, you know, she was still, you know, she was still, she was still a uh, baby. She was still a child. She was, she was 22 right. weeks, but yeah. So when she called me the other day, she said, Katrina, she said, oh my God. I was like, what? She said, I saw this series on black love. And she said, you, she said, now I understand what you and John, she said, she said, I know it's going to be hard, but I want you to watch it. And I watched it. It was hard, but I watched it. Yeah. And sometimes we have to do the hard things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, we have to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have to do the lot, hard thing. I always learn a lot of times God puts you through, like this, like with the breast cancer. You know, a lot of times God puts you through, through things 
So it's, they use for, not for me, but to help somebody else. So that's why I exactly. You know, I, I, when I went through what I went through, because, you know, God spared me. You know, I, I didn't need any chemo radiation. My husband, when he got diagnosed, he didn't need any chemo radiation. Uh, my mind was caught early, and, you know, and I was just, you know, and I was blessed the way God prepared me with that whole situation. So as soon as, you know, as soon as I found out and I found out, you know, different information, like, you know, you know, your mask, can, you know, can't, couldn't be felt on a regular mammogram screen. And I was like, that's why sometimes a lot of women that have been spread, you know, you, you know, you're at a higher risk. You know, you need to be getting extra screening. And I'm like, some people will say, I've got the mammograms every year. And then they then they find out they had to stage three. It was because mm-hmm. the mask was there, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't seen. It wasn't, and that's, it wasn't you know, and, th- and that's something that I dealt with as well. I was, you know, I went go to um, my breast, I went to a breast specialist at Memorial. And the Memorial mm-hmm. has all the specialists there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he would always, I would tell him, I said, this left breast. For a long time, it felt, I said, it feels so warm. I said, it's so warm. You know, he said, that's unusual. He said, for a breast to feel warm. And it was heavy. Right. It was heavier right. than my right breast. So, oh, you know, yeah. and I was like, and I, and I, so I was going like every quarter for this mm-hmm. left breast. I said, it feels, mm-hmm. I said, it's, it's hot to the touch. I said, and I'm concerned mm-hmm. about my breast. And we, you right. know, he did the, um, he did a biopsy. Everything came mm-hmm. back fine. Um, right. know, he said it was fibro. It, it was fibro. It, 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 it was fibro cystic. So I said, okay. So then I had to right. really change, you know, my diet and all that other mm-hmm. stuff and exercise a little more. But um, I'm just grateful for your journey right. because I've learned something tonight. <laughs> oh, good. And I just hope you've gleaned from, you know, me being transparent about, you know, what I went through with Olivia. Right. And, and keep a Maria's um, legacy alive. Mm-hmm. Keeping yeah. Maria legacy yeah. alive, you know, mm-hmm. and I just and it's it, it just an open dialogue, you know, with your husband and reference, you know, and regarding his feelings as well, um, because right. sometimes they tend to um, men tend to get into their own heads, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, they'll exactly. get silent, and so I'm like, okay, I need to. How do I break right. through this? You know, right. I, I don't want him to be angry with me because it, it has nothing to do with me. You know, it, it's this right. nature. You know, it, you know, it's right. this nature. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I had read something the other day, and mm-hmm. and I and I and I prayed about it before before the show. And when you said that okay. um, our story is not for us, it's for right. somebody else. And I was mm-hmm. like, I said, Oh God, I said. <laughs> I said, Miss Katrina must was reading what I just had written on that paper. <laughs> <laughs> I said, she must have read what I wrote. And when you said that, are you serious? Are you serious? You wrote you wrote that? I wrote that. I wrote it. I literally wrote that. I sure <laughs> did. I wrote it and I was like, Oh my god, Miss Katrina was in my thoughts just now. <laughs> See? I said, she was in my isn't, head. Isn't that, isn't that amazing how much how we are tonight? <laughs> mm-hmm. I wrote, um, yes. my story is the key that will unlock someone else's prison. Don't be afraid to share it, Veronica. I was writing it to myself. God right. can bring beautiful blessings from some of our worst circumstances. <laughs> yes, that's exactly yep. right. He sure can. He sure can. He sure can. Yeah, well, but tell our listeners. Our story is for God's glory. <laughs> oh, yes. That's, and I say that that's, a lot. I say this is, this is. You know, my story, his glory. Um, yes. I don't know. I don't know. He could have healed my husband at any time that he wanted to. At the last minute, he could have healed him. Right. But it wasn't. Mm-hmm. But it, the process was for me to grow and learn to help someone else, to be transparent right. on this, on uh, you know, on this journey and um, mm-hmm. on the lost, grief and loss journey. And also to, you know, teach us, teach me how to live forward as well. <laughs> right. You know, exactly. through, trans, through transparency. And I know mm-hmm. you have a new book that launched out um, October 27th, another anthology, The Unstoppable yes. Warrior Woman. Yes, The Unstoppable <laughs> Warrior Woman. Yeah. yeah, that's a story of 40 women telling, telling their challenges with stories. And, and this title in this, this book was, is called For Best Breast Cancer Survivor to Breast Cancer Advocate. So it's basically talking about Similar, similar things like my breast cancer story with my husband and I, 
you know, and then mm-hmm. my husband going first and me going second and, and then it tells some of my mm-hmm. brave moments. And my brave moments as being a Stop a Warrior woman, of course, was um, when my um, my mom died and I asked God, I prayed and I asked God for me to, to have me to um, be there when she transitioned, you know, so I can hold her hand and, and be there. And that, that's amazing how when the time came, like, the 20, 20 years prior, I mean, like 20 something years ago. When when my sister had passed, because that my, my sister passed, she died like suddenly. Oh my gosh, she she was fine. Like one day I'm looking at her, we're, we're laughing, and like the next day I get a call and she's you know and then she's gone. So she had a brain um tumor, an aneurysm that that's just you know like busted, and she just mm-hmm. she was not sick or anything, and she just dropped dead. <laughs> that was the hardest. She was 36. That was one of the hardest deaths that I you know I I mean I she was my idol, my oldest sister, my only sister, and that was so so that that pain was so hard. Then I actually had a, you know, when people say you have a heartache, I mean, my heart actually was aching to the point that I was like thinking I wasn't going to be here anymore. So I never forget, I went, and my mom was downstairs, and I said to my mom, I said, you know, mom, I said, I hope I die before you and dad. And she said, she said, why do you, why do you say that? I said, because, I said, because when Francina passed, I said, it hurt so bad. I said, I, I can't. I said, I, I, I don't want to be here when you, I said, I don't, I don't want to feel that pain again. It, it hurt too much. And my mom actually mm-hmm. looked at me and she said, she said, when it's time for me to go, she said, you're going to be okay. And when it was time for her to go, not only was I okay, even though, you know, it hurt though, but I'm just saying, right. I actually asked God, at that time, I actually asked God for, for me to be there to hold her hand when she died. <laughs> so it's amazing how, the, you know, how how you look back and, and you God brings you through so much, so much that, you know, you're just so you know, he covers you and you're so strong that you don't even know you have the strength to do something until after it's done. You're like, wow, you know. So that so that was something. So um so I, that was one of my brave moments I talk about being a Sapu Borean Gory woman. I also talk about the baby, like how I told you it's about for the um Right. How it's hard for the baby. And then I also talk about uh you know, relationships that I went through that wasn't that wasn't, you know, that, that wasn't too 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 good in my in my life and that I actually, when I was younger, I actually had a complex about being dark skinned, and it wasn't until I got older that I knew that my, you know, I learned my black was beautiful. So I talk about having a complex about that, and then, and then it goes back into me being an advocate for um, um, breast cancer. Right now, I, I am. I work for. I am. I'm an act lead ambassador, lead ambassador for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, which is the nation's leading um, advocacy for cancer. And right. I'm actually um, the act lead in my district in, in, in uh, Baltimore. And what we do is we advocate on for, to the legislators for for the patients for cancer to help with um, for, uh, help for, for funding for treatment, for funding for research for NIH, mm-hmm. and our big uh, our top priorities to help kids with the big tobacco. So I now I'm doing advocating, and then I, then I have you know, I have main. So basically, that's what the Stop the Warrior Woman story. Um, was about in my title is Breast Cancer Survivor to Breast Cancer Advocate in that book. That's beautiful. From pain to God's purpose. <laughs> <laughs> that is so beautiful. I thank yeah. you for sharing tonight. Oh, yeah. And I want to leave for having this. me. <laughs> You're welcome. I've learned so much about this estrogen positive cancer. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm I will be doing more research on it because my dad had okay. stage one a lung cancer, and so okay. like you say, we have to advocate advocate um for our family members. Right. And mama, I was his I was his advocate. I did I did my mm-hmm. research. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and you and have his, to um, Any, anytime somebody in your family or you have any, you have to do research. You have to read. You know, you have to actually find it. My mother, my mom, when she had dementia. You know, I, I read everything about dementia. I knew what, when she was in her last stages, I knew what she was in her last stages. I knew what actually was what was going to happen. You know, I, you know, I had to prepare mm-hmm. myself. Yeah, that was a right. hard. It was hard. It was hard. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just yeah. like you just stated that, um, reading up on your mom for dementia and, and, and it propelled you and prepared you, you know, for your for your journey. But Maria, I believe in my heart that when my dad was diagnosed in 2013, it prepared me that in the journey I was walking with my mom, with my dad's right. cancer, it prepared me the following year with my mm-hmm. husband and his cancer. 
Um, and, wow. and with him eventually okay. passing away. And I look at it, I said, because I was journaling the whole time that my dad was going mm-hmm. through his cancer. I would talk about it, you know, and let our family members know this, is, you know, today was a good day for daddy. Daddy's in a really, really right. good spirit. You know, I said, he's right. in here um, telling everybody about the preaching, about preaching the gospel in here. And people are actually listening to him, you know. Mm-hmm. And I said, daddy's getting, uh, I said, he's in chemo, but he's getting everybody saved he's in chemo. Wow. <laughs> you know? That's, wow, that's and, something. Um, and 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 it and it, ha- and it was that he had said he had asked God a question. Why did you mm-hmm. leave me here and took my and, and take my son? Wow. You know, and, and he's mm-hmm. I, he said I prayed for him. I said I prayed for him too, David. I said, but it wasn't to be. I said it's a lesson in it, um, in his death and everything. You know, it's a lesson in it for us. You know that I left here. You know, to be mm-hmm. brave, to be like you say, to be a brave warrior. <laughs> and we right. have to uh-huh. we have to war not. You know, in the physical, on our knees, in the spiritual, right. you know, talking to God. Mm-hmm. We have to be warriors right. and advocates as well. Um, exactly. And you have something that I, um, I, I, I like. It says, always believe in you, listen mm-hmm. to your heart, trust your instincts, know you can see your own strength, dream it, dare it, do what you are afraid of, keep the faith. Follow your vision and remember anything is possible if you only believe. I want to thank yes. you for coming on tonight. I appreciate it to the thank utmost you. and I thank you for, you know, really wanting to come back on the show that was canceled the last minute last week. I just appreciate it. I'm grateful and I'm humbled by it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am very humbled by, you know, and, and, and the consideration for it. Tell our listeners where they can find you and how they can find you. Okay, well, you can find me. Well, I, I'll give you my website to to uh, Maine because all my Maine's website is www.maineinc.org, and I, and also then my book website is www.ws-unshakablefaith.com, and all my um, um social media hand, handles are on there: Facebook, Instagram, and my my main page. All my um, information is on. My website. Believe that you're going to be okay. Believe that you can survive and thrive. Believe that you can reinvent your life. Be okay when there is not going to be an answer. You will come out bigger, better, bolder, and braver. Psalm 9017 reads, Let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. This has been Veronica with Pearl with Veronica, and my special guest, Katrina L. Shaw. Thank you all for listening, and you all have a good evening. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you for having me. (laughs) You're welcome. I enjoyed it. (laughs) Me too. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left Until the coming of the Lord will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangels, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Thank you for joining us, Pearls with Veronica. Thank you for tuning us on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us and share the file. I'm Jerry Woods Live Worldwide, and welcome to Positive Power, Double XI Christian Media. Thank you, thank you.